Hi everyone. Um, I'm recording this after the fact as the audio on the original recording made during class um, is pretty seriously messed up. So this is the uh, version of what we've talked about on Monday, September 23rd, when we talked about aspects of B cell selection. Um, in the lecture previous to that, we had talked through the stages of B cell development, where we had seen pro B cells that first had no membrane immunoglobulin on their surface. Um, they started out with germline Ig genes. They then did a heavy chain D to J rearrangement, followed by a heavy chain V to GJ rearrangement. At that point, the cell was able to put that heavy chain on its surface along with a surrogate light chain. That is, was called the pre-BCR, and when the cell did that, it was called a pre-B cell. Um, the pre-BCR is used by that pre-B cell to um, do a number of signaling events, and once um, the signaling is complete, we will see light chain rearrangement uh, in that pre-B cell. When the cell is finished with its light chain rearrangement, it will then have both a heavy chain and a light chain made, and it will express that IgM on its surface as an immature B cell. Um, you can see another view of this same process here. Our immature B cell um, eventually will leave the bone marrow and will um, go out into the periphery where it will be a mature B cell that will fight against antigen. If everything goes well in this process, of course, um, that's what will happen. But we do need to have a few tests to make sure that our immature B cell is all set. The first one looks really similar to something that we saw in the pre-B cell when it was testing the heavy chain. In fact, here you can see um, testing of the heavy chain at the early steps. So our pro-B cell will do its heavy chain rearrangement on one chromosome. It will potentially make a successful heavy chain um, that will be part of the pre-BCR. If the cell fails, it will move to the other chromosome and do rearrangement there. It will potentially get that productive allele the second time through. Um, if the cell fails, then it will not be able to receive a signal and will undergo cell death. Once that cell has made a heavy chain, and we don't really care whether it's the first or second try in making the heavy chain, that cell will be trying to make a light chain. Because we have both the kappa and the lambda locus for light chains, our B cell is going to get four tries to successfully make a functional protein at the light chain. Um, one thing to note is also something about the isotypes that are made early in the life of a B cell. So if you remember, um, we are making the variable region of the antibody from a V, D, and J segment coming together to encode the variable regions shown in red on the antibody. And then we have the constant region that's encoded by some set of exons, either the mu, delta, gamma, epsilon, or alpha. You can see that mu um, is the one that is immediately after, immediately five prime, the J segments and delta comes shortly thereafter. Those two are the closest. Our developing B cell will start out making IgM, but in fact, as you can see here, when that cell um, leaves the bone marrow, it typically will be making both IgM and IgD. This is the only time during the life of the B cell that it can make uh, antibodies and B cell receptors of more than one isotype. Um, what you will notice is that the IgM and IgD constant regions are the first two downstream of the V, D, and J regions, and there's a large gap of 55 KB before we get to another of those constant regions. When 
the B cell is making the transcript for the antibody gene, it's able to make a transcript that includes both the constant region um, exons for the mu heavy chain, or IgM heavy chain, and the delta heavy chain, or the IgD heavy chain. Based on alternative splicing, the cell can make both an mRNA encoding uh, the mu, aka IgM, and the delta, aka IgD. This is a change that's happening in terms of RNA splicing, and so this is a reversible change because the DNA is not altered here. And so in this way, the cell is able to make IgM and IgD at the same time. It can't make any of the other isotypes because they're way too far away. The transcript is not that long. Um, and so one of the things that we sometimes will do is we will look at cells that are making IgM and IgD as cells that have recently left the bone marrow. Um, that's one of the reasons why people have studied IgD in the past, even before we knew about uh, its function with basophils. When I've described VDJ recombination thus far, I've generally described it as looking something like this. Uh, and importantly, you see that VDJ recombination happens in the absence of our foreign antigens. The foreign antigen you can imagine is not present in the primary lymphoid organ. Um, in cases where it does show up in a primary lymphoid organ, we have some pretty bad consequences. So we should not think about those sorts of outcomes as yet. And so you can see that in the primary lymphoid organ, we're generating diversity in our lymphocytes. Um, we're making one lymphocyte of each specificity. And then if one of those lymphocytes encounters antigen, um, it will proliferate and make more of itself in the periphery. We also might have some other lymphocytes who never see their antigen and just persist as that one lone cell. However, in reality, this process looks something like this, where we do generate this dramatic diversity in the primary lymphoid organ. That diversity is so great that we actually develop a number of B cells in this case, but also T cells, when we're talking about T cell development, that are potentially self-reactive. We generate the full set of possible receptors that we could have, the self-reactive and the non-self-reactive, the dangerous ones, which are the self-reactives, the useful ones, which might uh, recognize a pathogen we'll see sometime in life, and even some useless ones that recognize no microbe that we'll ever come in contact with. There is then a process of deletion that happens in the primary lymphoid organs where those self-reactive cells are sort of purged and are not allowed to leave the primary lymphoid organ so that only the ones that are non-self-reactive are actually able to leave. This process is known as the process of central tolerance and is one of the key features of the clonal selection hypothesis. So when we think about clonal selection, we can see that all of our immature B cells have uh, B cell receptors on their surfaces, and importantly, all of the receptors on a single B cell have identical specificity for antigen. On antigen stimulation, the B cell will mature and migrate to lymphoid organs where it will replicate, its descendants will bear the same receptor as the parental B cell, and secrete antibodies with an uh, identical specificity. At the close of that immune response, when we've made a large number of descendants that have that same specificity for antigen, more B cells bearing the receptor for the antigen in question will remain than there were present at the beginning. So there'll be more, for example, of cell number two at the end of the response than there was at the beginning, and this will be one of the reasons why the secondary response is enhanced. But also importantly, B cells for self-antigens are going to be deleted during embryonic development. This process, as I mentioned before, is called central tolerance. Tolerance is a word that the immunologists use to talk about how we avoid having self-reactive responses. Um, there are a few different types of tolerance. Central tolerance, specifically, is the type of tolerance that happens in primary lymphoid organs. There are other types of tolerance that happen outside of primary lymphoid organs, which are called peripheral tolerance. Whenever we talk about central tolerance, we often can see some sorts of flaws 
in central tolerance that make it very clear that peripheral tolerance must be doing some important things as well. And we're going to see that in the process of B cell central tolerance today. If you look at the slides that we just looked at, um, and if you think about how you might imagine getting rid of or avoiding allowing that self-reactive B cell to go into the periphery, if you wanna make sure you have no autoimmunity, one potential option that you could see would be deletion of that B cell. And in fact, if our B cells get very, very strong signals, then they will undergo apoptosis and they will be deleted, they will be killed. Um, however, experiments have shown that deletion is only one of three things that can happen to a self-reactive B cell. Um, there are some interesting questions about how deletion works. In a mature B cell, which is outside of the primary lymphoid organ, which is outside of the bone marrow, when that B cell gets a nice strong signal through the BCR, that cell is going to be activated. It's going to proliferate, it's going to expand, it's going to make a response. Yet somehow the exact same response in an immature B cell leads to that B cell to undergo apoptosis and die. And so somehow our B cell knows where it is located when it is getting its signal. One might imagine that some of the other growth factors or other signals that are present in the bone marrow might contribute to this process. A group of scientists decided that they wanted to further study what happened when uh, self-reactive cells were uh, generated. There were lots of arguments in the field about what happened to self-reactive B cells. If you think about it, if you were studying deletion and you wanted to show that deletion happened, you would show that the B cell in question, responsible for the self-antigen in question, was missing. That makes sense. However, if you think about how you would show that for one single B cell, out of millions, one needle in a haystack, you could imagine that someone could argue that your B cell was not deleted, you just didn't find it. Um, perhaps you didn't look hard enough. Um, and so how do you actually prove that that cell is completely gone or completely missing? Experiments such as the one that are shown here were designed in order to try to address some of those issues. The experimenters made two different kinds of genetically modified mice for these experiments. The first are shown in the upper left, which are listed as the transgenic HAL mice. These are mice that have one gene added into the genome. It's added into the genome of every cell in the mouse. Um, and it encodes a protein called hen egg lysozyme, or HEL. This is a protein that comes from chicken eggs. Um, and that's really what's important about it, is that this is not typically a mouse protein, it's a chicken protein. However, in this mouse, it is now a self-protein where it was not before. You can imagine perhaps there's one B cell that develops that has the antibody that binds to hell, and that B cell now undergoes a tolerance mechanism where it did not previously. They also generated a mouse that is shown in the upper right. This mouse is a transgenic mouse for anti-hell. In this mouse, they have inserted two genes into the genome. One of them is a pre-rearranged heavy chain um, for the antibody that binds to hell. The other is a pre-rearranged light chain for the antibody that binds to hell. When B cells start undergoing B cell development in this mouse, that heavy chain will be transcribed and translated and it will lead to allelic exclusion of further uh, heavy chain recombination. Similarly, 
uh, the light chain will be transcribed and translated and will allelically exclude other light chains. And so as a result, 100% of the B cells in this mouse will make antibodies against hell. Oftentimes when I tell students about these types of experiments, this is a transgenic, a B cell transgenic mouse. So 100% of the B, B cells are um, for the receptor of interest that we're studying and immunologists do experiments like this all the time. When I tell students about this, they get very worried for this mouse. Because if this mouse were to go out into the streets of the world, um, it would probably get really sick and die. Um, because it's probably going to see many different types of microbes and it only has B cells that allow it to respond to hell. Um, however, we keep our animals in pathogen-free environments, and so this mouse is okay, even if it is rather immunodeficient. But now, it's not, we're not looking at the development of one B cell that responds to hell. We're looking at the development of many B cells, and it's much easier to track them and see if they're uh, changing. So this is one example of um, an experiment that someone could do. On the x-axis, we're looking at IgM, which is basically measuring B cells. And on the y-axis, we're looking at the ability to bind to the antigen hell. In the non-transgenic mouse, just imagine a mouse from the mouse store, we can see two populations of cells. One population that does not bind hell and that also does not express IgM. So these are the not B cells. And we also can see that there is a population of B cells. There probably is one cell up here that is a hell binding B cell, but it's hard to measure cells that are that rare. In that anti-hell transgenic mouse that we've made, um, we still have some cells that are non-B cells, but 100% of our B cells actually bind to this antigen hell. So these two mice are set, and you can imagine there shouldn't be anything too terrible in these mice regarding autoimmunity. One of them has a whole bunch of B cell receptors for hen egg lysozyme, but happily mice are not chickens. And so this is not a self antigen. Here we've added a new protein to the mouse's genome. It's not really a big deal. The authors then went ahead and crossed these mice and made double transgenic mice. So now the mice were making hell hen egg lysozyme in every cell of their body, as well as making 100% of their antigens that were, or their B cells that were anti-hell B cells. And so now we can actually see what happens when 100% of the B cells are self-reactive B cells in these mice. The first thing that they looked at, of course, was whether or not these mice got some sort of terrible autoimmunity, and they didn't. They seemed to be just fine. And so that indicated that some type of B cell tolerance mechanism must have been occurring to stop this autoreactive response. These are the data that the experimenters obtained. If you look at the left-hand column, um, the uh, x-axis is B220, which is a B cell marker. Um, on the top, we see uh, binding to our antigen, HEL. On the bottom, we see IgM. It's another marker of B cells. And so here you can see um, they have some non-B cells, which are these. They have some B cells um, here. Here you can see, again, they've got some non-B cells. They've got some B cells. Um, if we move forward, we can look at the transgenic mice that should be making the HEL uh, antibodies, you can see that we've got some non-B cells and we've got B cells that are making hell. Here again, you can see another view of those B cells. Um, and then we can look at the mice that have both the hell as a self antigen and the antibody against hell. If deletion were the answer, we would expect to see no B cells. However, if we look at the data, we notice that we see the presence of some B cells. Those B cells, however, do not bind to hell. So somehow the B cells still exist and they have switched the antigen that they bind. <laughs>
this was the first discovery of another mechanism of B-cell tolerance called receptor editing. And this is going to be a mechanism of B-cell tolerance, but just so you know, T-cells are not going to be able to do receptor editing, so this is going to be a unique one for B-cells. And so with our um, B-cells, we can see uh, new light chains being generated so that they can pair with the heavy chain and now the combined heavy and light chain will bind to a new antigen and perhaps no longer be self-reactive. So you can see that our cell starts out with a black heavy chain and a black light chain. Um, that cell, because it is reacting to a self-antigen in the bone marrow, might undergo receptor editing and start to make a new light chain. You can see a couple of choices here. Um, the way that this will work is that perhaps in our first rearrangement, the B cell will choose V3 and J3 and do rearrangement to put V3 and J3 together. But as you can see, the upstream Vs and the downstream Js are still present. The B cell will be able to receptor edit and read arrangement to use one of those outside Vs and outside Js if they're still possible and delete this uh, VJ rearrangement that has already been done. This is possible because the um, RSS on the V and the RSS on the J are of different types. So we can still do arrangement. Um, and so here you can see that same process happening again. So originally we had one V and one J chosen. That was a self-reactive cell. It bound to self-antigen. Can actually do another rearrangement, delete, and use another V, and thus have a new light chain, a new specificity. It can keep going with the rearrangements. If not, then it lives happily ever after, makes IgM and IgD, leaves the bone marrow, and moves forward. Because we have two kappa loci and two lambda loci, the B cell actually gets quite a few attempts at making an appropriate light chain um, via receptor editing to get rid of self-reactivity. You might wonder whether our B cell is able to do receptor editing at the heavy chain. Um, in fact, receptor editing is not possible at the heavy chain. When we make our V, D, and J rearrangement of the heavy chain, um, we actually delete all of the J segments. First, we delete the downstream J segments when we put D with J. Then we delete all the upstream D segments when we put D with B, D, J. Um, and so in the end, there are no more Ds to allow further rearrangement. There may be some leftover Vs and some leftover Js, but those Vs and Js have the same RSS and thus cannot be combined together with uh, in VDJ recombination. So receptor editing is not possible at the heavy chain. It is only possible at the light chain. So these data that I'm showing you here were one of the um, experiments that showed that there was the second option, receptor editing, that was possible for self-reactive B cells. The experimenters actually set up this experiment in two ways. One of them involved putting the antigen, HEL, as a transmembrane protein. You can see here that the figure is labeled membrane HEL. So hen egg lysozyme, or HEL, was a transmembrane protein um, on cells of the mouse. What that means is that when a B cell that was developing had a B cell receptor that bound to hell, it probably was going to be able to bind to multiple copies of that hell on the surface of one cell, have multiple B cell receptors come together and get a signal, and get a rather strong signal. The experimenters also did this same process but they made the antigen HEL a soluble antigen. So that means that it was a secreted protein. It wasn't on the surface of any cell. 
that makes it less likely that any individual B cell is going to encounter more than one copy of the antigen at any one time. It's just too diffuse. It's sort of all over the place. It's not collected together where it can pull together two different cells. And so you would imagine that these self-reactive B cells were receiving a weaker signal than were the previous ones. And so when the experimenters did the same experiment using soluble HEL, they got a slightly different response. Again, if you look at the Ig transgenic, you can see that we have um, all of our B cells binding to HEL. We've got a nice B cell population. With deletion, we would expect no B cells. With receptor editing, we expected B cells that did not bind HEL. And if we look in the soluble HEL double transgenic mice, we see that there are B cells, and those B cells, in fact, even bind HEL. Um, yet somehow these mice are not autoimmune. This led to the, to the discovery of the third mechanism of um, getting rid of uh, self-reactive B cells, and this is known as energy. So when a cell uh, sees self-antigen, here you can see it's seeing soluble self-antigen, um, it's probably getting a weaker signal, um, that cell is actually induced to go into a state known as energy. So it does leave the bone marrow, but anergic cells become unable to respond. So we get this cell that is completely unresponsive to antigen in the periphery. It's present, but it's unable to make a response. Um, and so this energic cell or energized cell um, is the outcome of the third mechanism of peripheral tolerance. Um, and so this is sort of the thing that will happen to the B cells with the uh, weakest um, interaction with self-antigen. All of these processes were happening in the bone marrow. Once the B cell leaves the bone marrow, it can then go on to potentially see other antigens, um, and it will then start to make responses like potentially becoming an antibody factory, like a plasma cell to make large amounts of antibody, or maybe becoming a long-term memory cell or differentiating in other ways. One thing that I do want to point out is that all of the central tolerance processes for B cells that I have told you about involve the B cell seeing self-antigen in the bone marrow. Unfortunately, all antigens that are possible do not live in the bone marrow. And so the flaw in central tolerance for B cell development is that B cells are not able to experience all possible self-antigens. If there is an antigen that is present only in some peripheral tissue, the B cell does not get tested against that antigen, and that B cell might slip through the cracks. And those uh, B cells are going to be really important targets of peripheral tolerance. We need to talk a little bit more about some of the things that happen in general in an ideal response in the periphery. So one thing that I want you to note about the periphery is that in the periphery, we turn off RAG. Once our B cell becomes a mature B cell, it stops um, expressing RAG and it will never start expressing RAG again. Um, RAG expression is done because that is, as we've mentioned, a very dangerous protein for our B cell to have. Um, there are, of course, some other things that are going to happen to that B cell in the periphery. Um, first of all, that B cell may start making large amounts of antibody. The difference between making a membrane-bound B cell receptor and a secreted antibody is based on what happens to the RNA transcript of that um, B cell receptor. So there is a site that allows for um, production of a secreted molecule because that molecule is a little bit short or there is an additional set of exons that can be used to make a transmembrane domain for our B cell um, that will give that B cell a transmembrane domain and allow for um, the membrane-bound B cell receptor. Again, this is something that's happening at the RNA level, 
um, RNA splicing. And so our cell is able to make both of these products and this is not a, re uh, this change is completely reversible. Um, two other things will happen to our antibodies um, when they are made by B cells in the periphery. So at some point during a response, we may see a process where that B cell switches isotype from perhaps IgM to perhaps IgG. That process of class switch may allow the antibody to have a better effector function. We can also imagine that the B cell can change its affinity for antigen, going from medium affinity to very strong affinity. That process is known as affinity maturation. Um, so if we think first about class switch, realize that the constant region is encoded by some different exons than the variable region. We saw this here before. And so we've got some exons on chromosome 14 that will encode each of the different uh, constant regions for our antibodies. And you'll notice that some of them are quite far downstream with this 55 kb gap between delta and gamma. Um, for making IgM and IgD, it's very simple because they are so close to the VDJ region. Um, they can all be transcribed on one transcript and then we can see the production of IgM versus IgD via a splicing event. However, to make the more far further downstream constant regions, um, we actually need to have another recombination event, and this is happening at the DNA level, so it cannot be reversed later. Um, in front of each of our constant region genes, there is a little site called a switch site, and we can see recombination events happening at the switch site so that the intervening DNA is lost, and we can now see transcription of the VD and J segment with a new constant region, perhaps the gamma constant region, and all that DNA that was in between has been deleted. Um, when I talked about this in class, um, a student asked about, well, I thought you just said that um, RAG was turned off for the rest of the life of the B cell, and in fact that is true. Um, there's a different set of enzymatic machinery that does this recombination. This is not performed by RAG. Um, I will also point out that it's not shown here, but there is a switch site before IgD. Um, and so B cells can um, delete out the M constant region and switch to making just IgD. We can also think about how affinity maturation happens, how our B cell gets a better affinity for antigen. Um, there is a mutator enzyme that leads to mutations, officially known as somatic hypermutation, of the VDJ segments um, of our antibody. And in fact, if you look uh, very closely, you will see that those mutations are picked up in specifically the CDR1, 2, and 3 regions of the heavy chain and the light chain. And so we have this mutator enzyme that actively mutates the CDR regions to improve the affinity of the antibody. Um, both of these processes, somatic hypermutation and class switch, happen relatively late in the life of the B cell. Um, they are usually things that we talk about when we talk about the secondary response, um, where we're thinking about the use of IgG, A, or E. Um, whereas in the primary response, early on we're using M. With M, we have low affinity. With uh, G, we tend to have higher affinity because we've had that affinity maturation. Um, happily, IgM, if you recall, is a pentamer, so it has 10 binding sites, and its low affinity doesn't matter so much because it has so many binding sites. Um, and G will be able to bind better because it has gone through affinity maturation. But as I said, both of these things happen later in the life of the B cell. Here is an overview of mechanisms that we've seen that are involved in the generation of B cell diversity. So B cells use multiple germline VD and J genes. They have both variable light and heavy chains. This depends on Reg1 and Reg2. We have P and N nucleotides. Um, allelic exclusion is a really great process here. We can have a product, aka the antibodies that are secreted that have the same kind of binding specificity as the receptor.
um, we have different constant regions, and somatic hypermutation is going to happen. Eventually, you'll see the full version of this table where we compare and contrast B cells and T cells, but for now, this is a good summary of B cells. Here is another version of a summary of what we've seen so far in B cells. So we have this irreversible change to the DNA um, that gives us recombination of um, V genes, junctional diversity, and puts the promoter and enhancer close together. Because those are all happening to the DNA, they cannot be reversed. We have um, issues of splicing RNA differently in order to give us M and D expressed at the same time and to give us both membrane Ig and secreted antibody. Because those are processes that happen to the RNA, they are reversible and can be regulated. And later in the life of that B cell, we'll have uh, isotype switch and somatic hypermutation. Both of those, again, involve DNA changes, and so they are, again, irreversible. Um, so we've largely talked through these yellow phases where our B cell has gone through processes in the primary lymphoid organ. And now our B cell is ready to move to the secondary lymphoid organ where it can start to search for infection, find infection, and perhaps even attack a microbe. However, if we really look at how that B cell acts in the periphery, most of our major B cell responses in the periphery require our B cell to act um, following some signals it has received from T cells. And so at this point, I really can't tell you any more about B cell responses until we spend some time discussing T cells and T cell responses. And that's why at this point of the semester, we need to switch gears and go through all the details of T cells before we can see the details of those late B cell responses. Um, there's one other thing that I need to mention. This is a nice view of what I've told you about thus far with B cells. So we have our developing B cell. It goes through some central tolerance mechanisms. Eventually, it will see antigen. It might make some antibodies. It might be a memory cell. All sorts of good things can happen to it. Officially, this is known as a B2 B cell. Um, and that's sort of the canonical, typical type of B cell that we see in the blood. It turns out there are other types of B cells that we know about. One of those types of B cells is shown at the top of this slide and is known as a B1 B cell. This B1 B cell goes through some slightly different developmental processes um, and makes a type of antibodies that are known as natural antibodies. Um, similarly, there's another type of B cell called a marginal zone B cell, um, which is another B cell that make, goes through a slightly different developmental process. Here you can see our follicular B2 B cells, the sort of standard B cell I've been telling you about, compared with a B1 B cell or a marginal zone B cell. Um, these are all found in different anatomic locations. So the B1 B cell is found largely in the peritoneal cavity, which you may remember seeing from our mouse dissection lab, while the marginal zone B cells are found in a part of the spleen called the marginal zone. Um, coming up with an answer to even the percentage differences in what pr portion of our B cells make up each of these can be difficult because it's much easier to study cells in the blood and it's harder to study cells that are buried deep in some of these tissues. And so we, it's hard to come up with a number estimate or an estimate for how important all of these different cell types are. They have slightly different developmental trajectories. Um, they use somewhat different V regions. Um, they're different in terms of what types of antigens um, and what types of responses they make. But these two cell types are both types of cells that seem to be on the line a little bit between innate and adaptive cells. And so um, these tend to be thought of as somewhat more innate-like B cells um, and may be sort of earlier types of B cell responses um, where our traditional sort of canonical B2 B cell response has evolved later. Um, so I want you to be aware that um, I am sort of talking about one particular type of B cell and there are some other types of unique B cell subtypes that exist, although we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about them. Um, and so that is the end of that lecture. Thank you.